welcome everybody to Catapult Education's truly first live online symposium. This is really something that we've been working on for a few months. Can't wait to share everything we're going to do uh, today for you. And openly, before we even show you the first slide, we're going to make this incredibly interactive. These are two of the most interactive doctors and individuals uh, I have come into contact with. And I'm just going to start with a little story. It's 35 years ago. It's 1984, 1985. These days, it's hard to remember the back then. And uh, I'm taking my like third or fourth CE course, and I'm really into TMJ. And there's Harold Gell teaching the course that day in Chicago, downtown Marriott, wherever it was. Some 30 some odd years later, I meet his son, Michael that who is co-presenting today with Lane. And I'm going to tell you, it's really amazing how small our worlds really, really are. And I think you're about to witness and watch a program that potentially will disrupt the way you think in such a positive way. And I'm going to say such a manageable way that the takeaways will be fantastic today. This could be your first step to moving to another direction. And with that, I'd love to show you the first slide. We see these every day. And the way I had been trained, and I'm gonna bring Lane into this in just one second was, how am I gonna deprogram this guy and get his teeth back to somewhat of a normal smile and get him back the way this patient wanted? And with that, I want to introduce Lane Martin, because this is a key way we're going to start this course. Lane, why don't you talk about when you look at this, what does this mean to you? So, Lou, thanks for having us. And this was my world for 15 years. This patient walks in. I look at them. I realize off the bat, I need to open up their vertical. I need to deprogram them. They're going to need crown and bridge, veneers, aesthetic crown lengthening. And the issue was I was fixing a symptom and, right. I, and I was missing the real problem here. This person has an airway issue and I missed it. Right. And you don't know what you don't know. And I would restore this person. I would put them in provisionals. I deprogram them in provisionals and then I put their permanent restorations in and what would happen? They'd end up chipping and fracturing. And this happened a lot to me. Right. And I missed it for a long time. And for the record, you were trained by the best. Absolutely. By the best. You were in New York City in a high-end restorative practice. So Chicago, New York, walking what we thought was the right way to do these cases. Yeah. And had a lab in my office, and we would always look at the vertical. I would look at the occlusion. Right. I would mount the case. Right. And like I said, I was fixing a symptom of a way bigger problem here, right. an airway issue. An airway issue. So now I'm going to fast forward to my partner on the right. So great to see you, Mike. Great just to great. See you, just it's a fantastic opportunity to share today. Tell me your thoughts on when you look at this. I'm looking at this patient, and now there's a good chance they're on ADD meds because I agree with Lane. It probably is an airway problem. Okay. But they're also now on Adderall, Vyvanse. They're on Prozac, they're on SSRI because they also have depression, also secondary potentially to airway. We know that the SSRIs increase clenching. We know that Adderall and the stimulants right. for ADD. So not only are they doing it for airway, but all the things that airway causes, now the medications that are prescribed right. for these things are making the clenching worse as well. So you got to really go back to root cause. Root cause. And that's... And I'm telling our audience out there, it's all about root cause. And I know after 30 years, I have missed so many root causes that you all have to feel comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with understanding. It's always about learning more. Right. Let's go to the next slide. Sure. So the next slide is really something you're all nodding your heads out there. This is traditionally the number one way we try to protect our patients from either wearing more of their teeth or protecting the restorations we have given them. And it's basically all wrong. 
How do you look at this? The truth. So getting back to the other patient, I did this for 15 years. After so I, I, I took that patient with the wear, with the worn down tentition, with the high vaulted palate, the narrow arch, and I gave him an upper flat plane night guard. So what I probably did was I probably took up tongue space, I made their airway worse, and I probably pushed their mandible back, and now I made their airway and sleep worse. So to me, this was belts and suspenders, but I was doing it wrong until I learned from Michael the real way to make a lower night guard. And is there ever an indication now to make an upper maxillary night guard flat plane, honestly? Bold statement, I would never make an upper flat plane night guard. And like I said, I've learned a ton from Michael about kind of repositioning. It's what I do in ortho now. We do it with bite block therapy. Michael does it with a lower gelb appliance. You're bringing their mandible down and forward, and that's the right way okay. to do it. But going back to what comes in, 95% of the patients that come in to me for TMJ and for sleep, particularly, let's say, a night guard, general dentist, the guy got an A in exams. He passed the nerves. He passed the, all his boards. Centric relations splint. Right. Cuspid guidance. Right. Anterior guidance. Right. Perfectly made, 100 on the exam. There's at least a 50% chance that it's closing the airway. Right. So American College of Prosthodontics, you can't open vertical alone on these night guards. Right. You're going to get into trouble. You know, you're supposed to do no harm. Right. Well, you're doing harm. We as a profession are doing harm on at least 50%. I say it's closer to 90% of these that are being worn every night. So that's what we're here today to talk about. And, and let me just say this to everybody out there. This isn't just a diagnosis course. I've gone through with these guys, my colleagues, you're gonna get answers today. So if you're not interested, if tomorrow you wanna to go back to your maxillary night guards, you wanna do full mouth without really understanding the root cause, this is not a good course for you. This is all about how to do this, understanding how best to take care of these patients. And the next slide is the mantra. Why don't you walk them through? When I would go to the, I would go to Chicago. I, my dad was president of the American Equilibration Society. Okay. It was about teeth. It was about equilibration. A lot of the big present, and it would be arguments, centric relation, but everything was about the teeth working interferences, balancing, Bennett movements, articulators, panographs. Then you talked about TMJ. There was no such thing as airway when we were growing. No one talked oh, about airway no. until Howie and I wrote a book, Gasp, until we started talking about airway really eight to 10 years ago. It's fairly recent. We, didn't, we couldn't visualize it. Right. We couldn't study it. There was no sleep testing. Now, we talk about at the pinnacle at the top airway first treatment planning airway trumps that's the takeaway airway trumps everything else it's the root yeah. cause you got to airway is the root cause right. for all this other stuff okay so airway contributes to bruxism to clenching the same thing that causes an airway problem causes tmj constricted envelope upper arch too narrow we we talked about nestor coraccini Weston Price, Pottinger, we talked about what's happened in our diet. If you believe that our faces are changing, if you believe and you see kids that don't have room for all 32 teeth and you see more crowding like we see in every generation, that is a symptom and a sign that there's an airway problem. And then it goes from there, bruxism, occlusion. The last thing we look at is the teeth. And, and I'm gonna say this, as you, proceed through this course, we're gonna show you simple solutions that can even avoid medical billing and almost one, two, three transitions in your practice really starting Monday. That's the key here. So I think you're gonna be a blow because immediately people go sleep, I've gotta do this, I've gotta do this. Stay tuned, why don't, we, why don't we get going? Why don't we get going? And by the way, your dentistry will get better. You'll have more fun. Oh, and for sure. it'll be win, win, win for everybody. Yeah. So I, I do want to talk to this real quickly sure. because for so long as a restorative and general dentist, what did I do? I did perio. Right. Right. I did biomechanics. Right. I did function and I did aesthetics. We're saying I want dentists and people are going to need restorative of dentistry. Course. It's just looking at airway first 
and making the case more predictable. And that's what Michael and I always talk about. Anyone could do a veneer. It's setting the case up so it doesn't fail. And that's why we're saying that airways should really be the first thing and not the last thing. Right. So here we go. Kid looks normal, handsome kid. Um, this is one of John New's slides. He gets a gerbil. He gets a present. He's allergic to the gerbil. He becomes a mouth breather. This is a transition, and I was a mouth breather growing up. This is what happens when you breathe through your mouth. This is the growth pattern that ensues. What do you What do you think, Lee? Yeah, we look at a child looks normal. As a teen, you could see they're starting to look like that mouth breather, that open mouth posture. We're going to talk about Venus pulling under the eyes, and then you look at them as an adult and now, as an orthodontist and in that world, I'm looking at faces. I love a profile picture because right off the bat, I could see retruded mandible, you know, the nasal label angle we always look at. And I love this slide. Bump in the nose. And I can, yeah. I can relate to that slide. So we're going to come back and talk more about that. You know, I asked the question before you get involved in this field, why should you care? Right. Like what? And I talk about airway more than sleep, but why even the field airway we're going to discuss as something that's really best treated by the dental team. But first, you know, you've got to get a good night's sleep. You're not going to get a good night's sleep unless you have an open airway. Who's the best person to manage the airway? The right. dentist, the dental we team. Are. Fatigue reversal, biochemical refreshment. That means you're forming new synapses at night while you sleep. Your biochemistry is getting refreshed. Toxins, we're going to talk about that. Your immune, this is the age of COVID. Your immune function will be strengthened when you, we all know that, right? You don't sleep well a few nights, you're more susceptible to catch a cold or you're more susceptible. Memory, dad has dementia now. Memory caused by inflammation. A vital part of keeping your memory, avoiding dementia, Alzheimer's is getting good sleep. And then you wake up in a better mood, less anxiety, less depression, less panic attacks. And this has kind of opened my world up. I thought the TMJ world was a great world. When I found out that I could start addressing these things, it, it kind of blew my mind that I, as a dentist, was addressing right. panic attacks, anxiety, and depression. So what really goes on when you sleep? So we talk about you know, getting into the different stages of sleep and we talk about growth and development, you'll see us kind of talk about staging. And those are the things we look at. Michael said it, you know, improve anxiety, refreshment. It's really a way to clear your toxins out of your brain. That's the benefit. There's so many benefits to sleep, especially now with COVID, right? But you talk about failure to thrive. Uh, human growth hormone gets released. So you see these kids that want to grow an extra three, four, five inches they're not getting deep sleep, they're not gonna do well. Fascinating. So one of Niedergaard's things, and just good sleep, deep sleep, is when you clean the brain of toxins. That's when the cleaning crew goes in, the lymph lymphatic system. That's when you clean that brain out. You need to do that on a pretty regular basis if you don't wanna get the gunk stuck right. in your brain right. and tau proteins and all of that. Physical restoration. So this is really the restoration of body and mind. You know, mind-body medicine. This is the epitome of putting together the mind and the body, restoring the body, restoring the mind. Um, information processing. What's your name? What do you? What's your? I know you. You look familiar. Everything that happens during the day gets put down in deep storage at night into the hard drive. And if you don't get good sleep you're probably not going to yeah. get that into the hard drive. Yeah. I love talking about the brain, mood regulation. You're going to be in a better mood. You're going to have less anxiety. Like I said, it's it's all part of getting good. And, and we said it already with the uh, with the immune system. Lena? So I, this is a slide we love, right? You can go three weeks without food. You can go three days without water, but you need it. Three minutes is all you look, right? And that's it's all about airway. You, we, we were talking about sleep, the benefits of sleep. Right. Michael and I talk about it. It's your airway. So, you know, the pillars of health, diet, got to eat well, got to exercise, good mental attitude, and you got to get good sleep. But of all the pillars of health, we think sleep is the most important because you're not going to have the exercise. You're not going to have the energy to exercise. 
you're going to make bad food choices. You're going to have cravings. Right. And so sleep really sets up the other two to be successful. So statistics, 90 million people suffer from sleep apnea. About 80% of them are really undiagnosed. I love that we talk about it comes in all sizes and shapes because a lot of people think of sleep apnea as like people like James Gambolfini or Justice Scalia, right, those are right. obese men. But we're seeing fit women, right. fit men with sleep apnea. It's a multifactorial problem, right? It's not just anatomy, it's physiology. And that's why we talk about ortho. We talk about growing the airway. 40 to 50% of people snore. I love that statistic. Snoring is the third leading cause of divorce in this country. And you hear that all the time because patients come in and they're like, I can't sleep in the same room as my spouse. Right, right. The snoring is so loud and it also affects them and affects their sleep pattern as well. But you know what the bottom line for today is? 50% of the patients in your practice tomorrow, today, have a sleep problem. They're in your hygiene chair. They're complaining of dry mouth. They have bad breath. They have, they just fractured the buccal cusp of 18. 50% of the patients in your hygiene program and in your restorative chair have an airway program. Well, and then I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's okay. So no one, no one walks in and says, Hey, Hey doc, I have an airway problem, right? They come in with pain in their jaw, massive pain, broken teeth, severe wear the crossfights, those are the people that really have a problem. And, and the truth is, I think you guys have such a, an, a great solution that everybody out there is going, God, I have to set all this stuff up just to start treating sleep patients. And the answer is you don't, no, you just you don't. don't. Let's go. So, you know, this starts at birth. So it starts with uh, mouth breathing. It starts with, uh, could start with snoring. So parents think that if they can hear their kid breathe at night mm -hmm. and they feel it's, they know their kid's alive. It's not cute. It's the a child should not be making, should not be a noisy breather, right? Right. They should be a nasal breather. They shouldn't be a mouth breather. We talk about the progression through rear's upper airway resistance syndrome, hypopnea. It's a progression and it occurs throughout and it starts at birth. That's right. the other thing right. that Gimenault has shown us. This starts at birth. Uh, breastfeeding is good for it. Some kids are born with tongue tie. So terms related to sleep apnea, yeah. this is the vernacular that a lot of physicians right. use. You do a sleep test, what's going to come back in the report? Apnea, which is really no breathing, 90% reduction in airflow. We talk about it being obstructed where it's crowding to the airway. There's central apnea where your brain is just, they're not telling you to breathe. Hypotnea is another term 30% of reduction in airflow with a 3% reduction in oxygen saturation. Michael loves rearas, right? We always talk Love about them. upper airway resistance syndrome. Right. These are the thin women. Yeah. Primarily. And it's really more about it's a crowded airway. And the next slide looks a little bit busy. And, you know, it's the mouth breathing slide. We always talk about mouth breathing. We love mouth breathing. We look, I was a mouth breather. I said, thank God my mother was an attractive woman. You know, I still got away, but I didn't have to be a long face person. Mm -hmm. I grew up as a mouth breather. It could have been corrected earlier. Could have had myofunctional therapy. There's a lot of things that could have been done. This is what a classic mouth breather looks like. They've got that bump on the nose like I've got. They've got the maxilla gummy smile. So when you see these things in practice, right away, you're gonna see this person is a vertical grower. This person is more all American, more of a horizontal grower. Right. <laughs> these mouth breathers are predominantly uh, uh, vertical growers. And uh, you know, it's sometimes hard. Are you a mouth breather? So that's the thing that you wanna recognize in all your patients. Are they a mouth breather right. or are they a nose breather? And that's something we're trying to get kids at a very early age to become nasal breathers and to put their tongue up on the palate and have good posture from the get-go. Yeah, and if you see this patient walking in, <coughs> yeah. you the you, office manager needs to realize this too. And that's, we want to train the whole team on this to look at that person and be like, you know what, I think that kid's going to have a problem or I think that adult's going to have a problem. And we're going to talk about what age you should intervene on these cases as well. 
So snoring, it's usually <coughs> not just a noxious sound. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many patients come up to me and go, Mike, you saved my marriage. I really, I can't thank you enough. And how more and more guys are coming in. And I say to the guy, look, your wife's great. I like your wife. She's great, but you're my patient. Right. And I believe that you also may have some underlying things. Maybe you could feel better. I've got to have leverage. I want leverage right. whenever right, I right. you too. I want you to feel better. Like I want you to put this thing in at night because you're going to wake up feeling a little bit more mojo to get your mojo back. Right. Here we go. When you breathe, air travels down your throat, through your windpipe, and into your lungs. The narrowest part of that that pathway is in the back of your throat. When you're awake, muscles keep that pathway relatively wide open. But when you sleep, those muscles relax, allowing the opening to narrow. The air passing through this narrowed opening may cause the throat to vibrate. That causes snoring, which many people experience. But in some people, the throat closes so much that enough air can't get through to the lungs. When this happens, the brain sends an alarm to open the airway. Most often, this is associated with a brief arousal from sleep. The brain quickly reactivates the muscles that hold the throat open. Air gets through again, and the brain goes back to sleep. This disorder is called obstructive sleep apnea. So just a couple of points about that. Yeah. I mean, that kind of, the reason we're here today right. is that we're working with the maxilla and the mandible every day of the week. Right. That's what we do. When the maxilla goes back, the soft palate is behind the maxilla, it blocks the area. When the tongue goes back, like we said, with right. gravity at night, you get snoring or sleep apnea. The men get snoring and sleep apnea. The women get those brief arousals from sleep. See, the women are healthier than us until menopause. These receptors activate and they just never get down into deep sleep. They get these arousals. They have disturbed sleep. They don't have oxygen issues. They don't have apnea. They're exhausted all the time. We say, yeah, it's the three kids. It's the husband. It's not that. It's really those brief arousals. So I think that's great. You can go back and watch that again. But this is basically the pathophysiology. So busy slide. And what Michael was talking about was you go to sleep, your muscles relax everything gets narrow. So what happens when you get that narrow airway, your oxygen drops, your CO2 goes up, and your brain's like, all right, you got to take a breath. And that's when they're going into fight or flight. We right, talk about sympathetic right. activation. You go into fight or flight, you have an arousal, you wake up, the muscle tones relief. And this is where we're asking the questions about the patient on multiple meds for hypertension, because their heart rate and blood pressure are going up and down all night. So that's a big red flag when you see that patient come in that are on multiple meds for hypertension that are having the cardiovascular comorbidities, it's putting a ton of pressure on their heart. Right. And what I want to say is it goes one of two ways. Either you're usually a heart patient or you're a brain patient. The fat boy, Joe, the fat boy from Dickens, either you're the fat kid lethargic or you're the ADD, the hyperactive kid. So. For some of us, it affects our brain. For some of us, it's diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and card the, cardio the inflammatory cardiovascular. So I think I find that fascinating that it kind of diverges. Wow. Yeah, and that's it. And Michael, that's a great point. I think starting off with an airway problem and, and sometimes less severe, you're going to get those neurocognitive problems. I think once you get into that severe sleep apnea, like Michael said, you're going to get the stroke, the AFib the real significant cardiovascular problems. So we're back to the clench. We are. So it all comes back to the clench. So now that we see this in a little bit more detail, what do you think's causing, what, what do you think's causing the, the wear of those teeth? What's causing the clench? I love this slide. Yeah, I, we, we all could, do. We, we, could we talk, all do. We could talk through this slide for an hour and so let me just say this as sure. we get into it and we don't have an hour for the slide and I know, yeah, I know. Go. but the truth is when it says stress question mark and most dentists me included go to a patient you see where do you have stress yeah and the truth is 
we're not talking that kind of stress. Yeah. We're really, really not. It's stress from suffocating. Right. And I think right? and that's, that's the key point. And, and that's the whole point where, you know, I always ask patients, you know, if you get scared or you choke on something, what happens? You clench and you tighten up. Right. And the fact is, these people are posturing forward to protect their airway. That's why I always ask about CPR. I was with a group of dentists and I said, patient had an anterior open bite, no power functional habits, but they had wear on their central incisors. And I asked the question, I'm like, how did that happen? And they all looked at me and I said, when's the last time you guys took CPR? That patient is posturing forward subconsciously to keep their airway right. open. So when you see wear on anterior teeth, Right away, you have to think, I think that person might have an airway problem. And, and, and let me just say this. In treating older patients, and I treat a ton of them, and you start seeing even just the wear on eight and nine, yes. seven and 10, where you can just rebond in sizal edges. You have a great saying about how often teeth come together. What's the saying? What's the number? You're gonna the next slide. We're gonna go through it. But you you know what I'm saying then? Yes. Because if you're seeing that word, you go, I'll just do a couple little composites and we'll fix it. You're masking it. You're well, not really fixing. We these spoke things. about it yesterday. Yeah. No one should break a tooth, right? Which unless, is a crazy thought. Unless your tooth is that structurally compromised, no one should ever break a tooth. So the next slide, we're gonna go through. I love this. So let's go. Right? How long should your teeth touch a day? 20 minutes okay. when we swallow. 20 minutes a day. Yeah, right. when we swallow. We need to breathe for 1,440 minutes a day. Our airway needs to trump the teeth. Right. The next question, how long, how much should our teeth wear down a year? 10 microns. It would take 100 years to wear down one millimeter of tooth structure. Yet, I had so many patients right. that came in with severe wear, I never asked the questions about sleep and I built them up. I deprogrammed them like we said, right, and we right, built up their right. vertical. And you just built the vertical up. Absolutely. Yeah. But I like your question about the anxiety, the stress. Right. Now we blame the patient. Exactly. Now we send them to a therapist. Now we want them to try it and they should lips together, teeth apart. My dad taught me that right. tongue up to the spot. It's all good. But this patient probably has a sensitized nervous system right and we're going to see they have irritable bowel they have migraine headaches they've got tension headaches their whole nervous system is sensitized and uh we're going to talk more about that great so we're back to the primitive night guard um you know part of this course is it's not really the low hanging fruit is take everyone who's in a night guard now we're going to show you what to do there's a way to make a night guard that you actually open the airway and so we're going to talk about that i know so I'm going to just say this yeah. to everybody watching, and I'm included. The next difficult discussion is going to be when you're seeing patients that you put night guards in, and you're going to have to convert them, get a sleep test, which we're going to talk about, which is so easy with what we're going to talk about, but also convert them to a new appliance that we're yes. going to close today on. And so overall, we're going to give people an answer to convert from these to a proper bruxism night appliance, day right. appliance, right. all in one. Day and night. Day and now night. That yeah. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once, hopefully, you're going to get the light today or the answers right. to maybe some of these questions that have been bothering you for years and years. We talked about the paradigm shift. Yep. So this is really about airway first thinking. We called it uh, an airway centric approach, not a centric centric, not just centric relation, but airway centric, airway first treatment planning. And I think that it's gonna make your restorative better, your orthodontics can be better, your patients, it's more moving into the health and wellness field in dentistry than being the tooth restorer. Right. Changing kind of your role and how you think about yourself you know, in dentistry. I mean, we still have to fix teeth. Not, we're not saying you're not fixing teeth. Correct. We're just saying we got to fix the root cause first. Yeah. And I think fixing the teeth are a lot easier when you look at airway because what I said before, so many of those patients that I restored would chip restorations. Right. Or they'd break. I, right. right. Or they'd posture forward and they'd have worn down, right. you know, 
surfaces of the Emax or the zirconia. Right, right, right. And I never right. ask the questions about airway or sleep. And I think you're going to have more comprehensive and well thought out treatment plans. It's actually going to involve more dentistry, not less dentistry, right. because the dental, there is a dental solution, whether it's orthodontic restorative to most of these cases. Yeah. So screening tools and some things that we don't have. So we think that every practice should at least be asking questions. We're going to go over the medical history. You know, years ago, I, I said, why am I wasting? Why? Let me just get to treating right. the patient. Right. Like, what is there in the medical history? And you worked in a hospital. Yeah. You had that background. Now I find the medical history is so valuable to me. We're going to talk about that. What about the Epworth and stop that? So some of the sleep questionnaires are great. A lot of the insurance companies use the Epworth. I don't love the Epworth. It talks really about tiredness. The physicians use the stop bang. We love the stop bang. Yeah. Super simple questionnaire. In terms of pediatrics, there's a Bears questionnaire. The PSQ is the pediatric sleep questionnaire. It's 22 questions. Talks about cognition, behavior, breathing. Great questionnaires. So yeah, we'll we'll show that in a little bit. Let's just talk about this uh, medical history. So a lot of patients coming in, again, they're not gonna tell you they have an airway problem. Men are in denial. It's not, I just, her problem, it's not my problem. I don't snore. Men are in denial. Don't raise your voice, okay. <laughs> women, women speak in code, right? right? Women speak in code. You know, I purr, I don't really have a problem. Are you tired? Would you, could you be more refreshed? Yes, I could be more refreshed. So when you look and you see that they're on reflux medication, and like, I don't know about in Chicago, but it's the same as New York. Almost everyone, Everybody's everyone on reflux. is on an SSRI. Right. Everyone's in an anti-anxiety. What do you take it for? Is this more for depression, anxiety? Oh, it's for anxiety. Everyone's on Lexapro, Wellbutrin, right? It's crazy. Probably yeah. half the patients. You and agree? then, yeah, and then the acid, every single patient is on a protein pump inhibitor, right? Prilosec, Nexium, they so, all have acid reflux. Right. Go on. No, I was going to say, and a lot of it is from snoring. We talk about the negative pressure in the airway, and, and that's the way, causing a lot of that stomach contents to come up. And so, is it really acid reflux or is it really an airway issue? So, Sorry, Michael. So, let me just no. ask you this then. Yeah. The medical history. I mean, I really believe that if all of a sudden you see these comorbidities, my buddy Jeff Horowitz talks about these comorbidities and he shows these percentages. It's it's incredible. So as you're going through this, and I know you love to stop bang, but I think the number one question you would ask a patient is, are you tired? I swear to God, because there's always no's, no's, no's on the stop bangs and all these other things, but all you go is, are you tired? And I think you're now opening a discussion. Am I off here? Number one complaint in my practice. Yes. I've been doing this 38 years. I've been doing sleep 31 years. I say it differently because are you tired? Nah, I'm not tired. I have five cups of coffee, Lou, in the morning. I'm right. not tired. Right. Okay. Lou, could you be more refreshed? Oh, yeah. Okay. I could be more refreshed. So I try to soften it because I'm in their face a little bit. Are you tired? Like I'm judging them. But if I say, do you think you could be more refreshed? I love that. Refreshed. Take so, away. Take away. Yeah. Ask them if they could be more refreshed. And for me, New York City, where, wherever I practice, number one thing, I'd like to be more refreshed. Now, I don't know about you. I'm 64. I'd always like to have more energy and like to have it working right. out. But I'd, who wouldn't want more energy? So could you be more refreshed? And then you look at, by the way, you go to CVS, Dwayne, you go nasal flonase uh all the stuff everyone's got sinus issues am i right mm -hmm. not just from great yeah. neck but everyone's got sinus issues and everyone's using nasal sprays or they're using you know mucinex or something to try to open up their sinuses because as our faces got smaller our sinus cavities got smaller our noses got more narrowed and so it's an endemic problem of homo sapiens and I love Lieberman's book, and I love James Nestor's book on this. So I think the takeaway for everybody is asking your patients when you see these, are you feeling, not tired, but do you want to feel more refreshed? And the follow-up yeah. to that is, remember, the kids that had ADD as yeah. kids, you know, we call it as an adult. No. 
difficulty concentrating. Yeah. So if you're could be more refreshed, and then you let's talk honestly about our performance at work. Right. How sharp are you? How's your mind? Are you, are you? Can you read one page? What did I just read? I read a page and I have to reread it three times. Hello. I walk into a room. Why did I walk into this room? I right. knew I came into this room. I have to walk out of the room, and I go shit. I know I walked. Sorry. I know why I walked into that room. Right. Now I go. Where did I put my keys? You know, Lou, you look familiar. What's your? I, I know you. I know I know you. Right. So. So everybody out there is running for a sleep test because probably one out of every two people out there. And. Right. The most, the other big takeaway here, and Michael said it, the ADD, ADHD, right? Because this is the default diagnosis for every kid that's going into the PG system with a cognitive behavior issue. And it might not be that. It might just be they're not getting enough oxygen. But you should rule brain. it out. You have to. You have to. And by the way, the kids that have hearing issues, speech issues, how many kids are in speech therapy today? A lot. Yeah. Sensory integration issues, feeding issues as a kid. A lot of those kids also have airway issues. So we could, this is again, this is this a great, is, this right. is a great, great topic slide. right? Because this is what you're going to see. If you now start and you go back, this gives the medical history to me as a dentist. See, this is the wet best way to integrate us with medicine. Yeah. Because now this stuff all becomes important because now we have a role before. Okay. The teeth to be cleaner. I understand about the high risk, but, but I can really impact it's bi-directional because if I treat the airway, the ADD gets better. If I treat the airway, the depression gets better, the anxiety. So now as a dentist, I've got these levers. I never had it before. So I'm really integrated now with the physicians in a way that I never was before. This just shows you what the airport looks like. We, we advise that you give this to every patient. It's going to tell, you know, how tired they are. We love stop bang. So stop bang, for those of you who don't know, S T O P S do you snore? T are you tired? O has anyone observed you stopping breathing, which I always ask. Um, blood pressure is P. Do you have elevated blood pressure? And then the bang, B A N G, B M I, weight, age, it's men. It says over 50, but also women that are menopausal or older, large neck, and then male or a woman again around menopause. But again, it could be a woman of any age that has this, uh, these arousals. It could right. be your thin women that right. work out three times a day. Bears, Lane? Yeah, we don't have to go through these forms, okay. but people, Probably, can, yeah. people yeah. can download these forms. It's great to put in your medical history. It gives you a ton of information. So. Patient walks in like this, left picture actually was a patient of mine who had tonsils like this. This person's in trouble, right? This is a crowded airway and obstruction. Slide on the right is the adenoids. You could see this sometimes on the Ceph. Michael's comb beam, a lot of the comb beams have this. They're amazing to show really the tonsils and adenoids. But you know what I find amazing about this? How old is that patient? 16, 17, 18? You ever ask yourself, no one said anything. Right. The pediatrician said, let's watch it. They'll shrink. Let's watch right. it. The brain's developing. Now they're in ADD meds. They're learning. They have issues in school. They have behavioral issues. They've got peer-to-peer -peer conduct issues. Well, let's watch it. So we see this. Really, we see it too much. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, and I would say, and we'll get into cone beams. But for all of those people with comb beams, just honestly, just go look up adenoids and you can see these things yeah. on comb beams. Every day. Yeah, every day. On every patient. Yeah. These are some of the signs that your patient uh, may have an airway issue. So obesity, we were talking yeah. before, the large neck. Yeah. Now, by the way, men put on weight in their stomachs and their yeah. faces. Women, that happens after menopause. So weight, where you put on the weight is very important. Mouth breathing, we spoke about that before, the open mouth posture. Myself and Michael are both mouth breathers now as adults, we're having a lot of problems. Right. The frequent sinus yeah. issues, I'm getting treated myself right. with the palatal expander. The tonsils and adenoids we spoke about. So more and more we're looking at 
tongue posture, low yeah. tongues as being responsible. Because the tongue, my tongue was never up on my palate as a right. kid. Some people have tongue ties. Some people are just mouth breathers from the get go and they never become nasal breathers. So one of the one of the important things for myofunctional therapy, my daughter is studying to be a speech language pathologist. And one of the things that we want to encourage kids as early as possible is to become a nasal breather. Right. And James Nestor really talks about that very well in his book, Breath, if you haven't read it. So you can train kids. You can train kids and adults, but yeah, you have to train the kids to be a nose breather, but also give them the anatomy to open it of up. Of course. Uh, tongue tie, lip tie. Lane, this is one of your favorites. Yeah, the narrow crowded dental arches, the high vaulted palate. You know, we, we always talk, the roof of your mouth yeah, yeah. is the floor of your nose. Right. So myself, high vaulted palate. Myself. Right? It's encroaching on your nose, the frequent sinus infections, the frequent colds, the runny noses. We're going to see that in so many of the kids that have that high vaulted palate. And that's why we're talking about early intervention with orthodontics, a ton of expansion, no matter which adjunct you're using, we're always talking about expansion. So if I see a narrow palate and some people, our friend Scott talks about narrow, narrow palate syndrome, it's become so common. What do you do? We're going to talk about the laminates. What we do in the past, put laminates on, but you see the veneers, veneers, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. New York term. Go ahead. Scallop yeah. tongue. I see a scallop tongue. The first thing I'm thinking about David airway problem. So if you take medical history, and now you're doing science. You're doing your science. I, I mean, how much do you have to be knocking on the door here to realize that those 50% of those patients- They're right there. They're right there. Now, the hygiene, the hygiene program yep. can pick this up. The dentist can pick it up. Your front desk can pick it up looking in the reception area. You're gonna, we're gonna show you what a malapati is. That's how easy it would be to intubate someone looking down their throat. Uh, obviously snoring, uncontrolled hypertension. You just can't get it under control. I'm getting a lot of referrals from cardiologists now for yeah, arrhythmia exactly. for this too. Yeah. Crossbite. Lane loves to talk about crossbite. He calls it an X-bite, but crossbite is a huge so, indicator. The other thing that people talk about is, does someone have a large tongue? Right? It's not that they have a large tongue. There's just not enough room for their tongue. Right. So we like right. to look at I don't know if everyone remembers Carva Wilson, that's an orthodontic thing, but you know, lower molar inclination. The other part of this slide that's really important, we were talking about it. I can never unsee these things. Now that I know about it, I can never unsee these things in my practice. Right, right. And I was taught by some great people. I went through Barry Rayfield's airway mini residency and I learned so much. And we spoke about the FedEx logo. Right. Someone pointed out to me the FedEx logo. We'll tell everybody. There's a white arrow between the E and the X. I can never unsee the white arrow. And I never want anyone to unsee these things. Right. And that's really so much of the point of this presentation today is the people that are walking in, you and Michael alluded to it, they all have a problem. Yeah. Let's go through these a little bit. So forward head posture, we're going to talk about that in two seconds. They have to have a forward head posture because they have to get through the next minute of life. And when you go like this or put the head in extension, it opens your airway. So let's say screw anything else. I'm going to do that because I want right. to live. This is just an example of a scallop tongue. So once you see those marks on the side of the tongue, yeah. you got to say that palate's not bit the patient's pressing their tongue forward. Cause again, they want to live. Everything's a compensation for something else. We want to get at the root cause. And this is what uh, my palate looks like. Right. I have yeah. an expander and now we're going to try to take it from, you know, that Gothic arch to the Roman arch. V shape to a U shape. Yeah. Those are the cross bites. Again, classic sign that the maxilla is underdeveloped. The tongue has been down on the lower arch. There's been excess horses on the upper arch. These are pretty obvious. And just real quick. So a lot of these patients have nasal obstruction and that's something that we want to we're trying to fix. We talked about bruxism. Uh, Lane loves to talk about, you know, failure to thrive, growth issues. Yeah, so the N3 part of sleep is where most kids develop and they get that growth hormone. And as adults, it's really more 
kind of us being more refreshed, that reparative part of sleep. But when you see a kid walk in and they're really under that growth chart, start thinking about a sleep problem or talk, an airway problem. Yeah, we talked about ADHD. Again, it's the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is not getting adequate development. This kid's not breathing well. They're not sleeping well. Reversible, but you got to get to it. Kevin Boyd likes to talk before age five. Right. I like to talk right. about before age five. Right. If they're at risk, let's intervene even at two and a half or three. Number one thing in our practice, tired yep. or excessive daytime sleepiness. Are you refreshed? The where? The tori, a sign that they're clenching. We talked about reflux and Steve Park does a great. So once that acid comes up, if it goes into your sinuses chronically, they call it sinusitis. You know, you're really in trouble. If it goes into the throat, the back of the throat, you've got that hoarse voice. You got something caught in the back of the throat. If it goes into your lungs, they call it pneumonia. And that's when people start to right. get real problems with that chronic pneumonia. So wherever the acid goes, it goes into your ears. They call it tinnitus. So I never realized that. I didn't you, know that either. You didn't know that? No. So one of the causes of tinnitus yes. and ear fullness is the acid goes up into the, into the ears. That. Yeah, fascinating. So Steve Park is really, he's really taught me a lot on this. And then retro, you know, I grew up with my dad. So right. retreated jaws, retronathia. So could you go back to that? Sure. Point? So nasal obstruction, can I ask you this? Sure. Do you find in your careers that as you're looking at comb beams, seeing that people are mouth breathers, and if you're looking at a comb beam, and I know we'll touch on it, but if you see the septums are not equal, you see the sinuses, are you referring out to ENTs? Could you touch on, or is that a bad No, thing? that's a great question. So number one thing that I see when I'm going through my comb beams, again, narrow face, narrow nose, Right. If I send it, this is my analogy. I'm a, my nose is like a 500 square foot apartment in the village. I straighten all the walls. I'm still in a five, I'm in a damn small apartment. Right. If I take all the furniture out, I'm still in a 500. I want to build them a 1500 square foot apartment. How do you do that? Widen the palette. You see, so it's interesting, and I'm just going to say personal story: two deviated septums fixed, still narrow palate, still can't breathe through my nose. Exactly. So we okay. we understand what right. the ENT does not understand. Look, everyone's in a silo. Everyone thinks exactly. that they can solve the problem. We have to work with our ENT colleagues, our ENT, and we used to send everything out to medicine, get nothing back. So it's a combination, yes, nasal valves, but let's look at the root cause even of nasal obstruction. And that this happens at a very young age. So Lane talks about it. his program, a lot of what wow. Lane is doing in orthodontics and what we're now doing is enabling the after part of our treatment is widening that enough so that they can breathe through their nose. And by the way, X clear spray yeah. and mute nasal stents. So everyone in my office gets a free sample of this xylitol, this clear nasal spray, yes. and everyone gets mute nasal stents from Australia. And then 35% of my patients can't live without it. Right. They must use it every night because this is 25 to 30% of the problem. And then behind the maxilla, behind the mandible yep. is 75% yep. of the problem. So fascinating. So real quick, and maybe we'll have questions at all, uh, Trevor, in a little bit. So Lane likes to talk about venous pooling. I think it's a great, great, great sign of something to look at. Yeah, it's from nasal congestion. A lot of this. So what are we looking at, Lane? We're looking under the eyes. Okay. You know, that's a that's really a telltale sign that someone has a lot of nasal congestion. Are, are you looking that, at the lower eyelid? Yeah, under the eyes. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Under the eyes. And so the pterygoid plexus, they it won't drain. The blood flow won't drain, so okay. it appears like that that under oxygenated blood is under the eyes. Okay. Yeah. So we always like to look at upper lower jaw. That's why we love the profile pictures in ortho. We talk about A point, B point. So it could be a retreated lower jaw, a retreated upper jaw, or a lot of times retreated both jaws. Right. So more more than not, the mandible's in the right position. The, the maxilla is underdeveloped. I'd say that 82 McNamara said 82% wow. of the time, it's a pseudo class three. My dad talked about it. The mandible's fine. Right. 
it's that maxilla needs to be brought out. Okay. You can see the fingerprint. You can see the thumb up there. I always ask, were you a thumb sucker? Some are, some are not, but they never got development because they never breathe through the nose. By the way, if we never breathe through the nose, we also have flat cheekbones. And you can see one side versus the other side. You can tell if they breathe through their nose because if you don't use it, it's not going to develop. Crowding. So the crowding, you know, same thing. Yep. The fish but the crowding so the is X bite. I, I, we like to talk about the X bite where everything kind of converges in. So in crowded teeth, we like to interact. We, we're not trying to take out teeth. So that's the line. Of you, course. You go to the orthodontist and go, mom, we have to take out four bicuspids. Right. No. Wrong way of wrong thinking. Wrong way of thinking. Wrong way We've of thinking. That. Yeah. Signs of a mouth breather, again, classic signs, you know, whether it's Napoleon yes. Dynamite or it's this girl, this is what you're going to see. And most of these kids will start to ad adopt a forward head posture. The over jet, mandibles back. And what do you want to do in these cases? What do they do? The orthodontist wants to pull the maxilla back to camouflage, right. to meet the retreated mandible. So this is what I've been hearing. I've seen it from my right. dad and I, I've seen the orthodontic forever. community forever. They're still trying to bring the maxilla back because I think they're not really looking at growth and development and not looking at the airway. And if you have any questions, if you go into the chat box and you we invite you to send in some questions. We're happy to answer any questions live. Uh, ask us anything that you'd like to about any of these topics. This is a big. This is the big one that we see more tongue tie. You know, so, and so I don't walk us through it. tongue tie with sleep and all and airway. Tongue tie starts at birth. Okay. In Brazil, you must check for this with the Adfar score with the yep. score you get yep. at birth. You have to check for tongue tie because this will make it harder to latch on when you're breastfeeding. And then if that tongue can't get up to the palate where it should be, you're never going to get development of the maxilla. So you'll have speech issues. You won't develop the, You're going to have an airway problem. I, every day on my Facebook, I see there's another article every day about this is a phenotype. This is associated with obstructive sleep apnea and starting in children. Okay. So you got to look for this. You have to do myofunctional therapy before you release the tongue tie. You've got to get those tissues ready to respond. Otherwise, it's going to stay bound down. You know, in dentistry, we're very black and white, right? Like we tend to look at anatomy. We need to look at physiology. We need to look, look at soft tissue. I mean, we're seeing orthodontic surgical cases that are relapsing because no one addresses the soft tissue. So myofunctional therapy is really physical therapy for your tongue, your soft tissue. So important, especially before doing orthodontic therapy. Did you know my mom was a myofunctional therapist? Did you? I didn't, I didn't no. tell you that. Study with Danny Garlander. And now my daughter is becoming one. So, so, you, so yeah. let's go back to. And sure. Just, so and I'm, again, you might as well all know that I probably have made as many mistakes, if not more than all of you out there. So I've got my CO2 laser. I routinely just release these tongues because the patients just want more tongue movement. Yes. There is so much more to it than doing this 30 second to two minute CO2 laser so that, procedure. That's Please. a great point. So for adults, they need therapy because the analogy I use is if someone tied your shoelaces together, <laughs> Yes and you had them tied together for five years, right? and you clipped them, and you tried to walk, you'd fall. Right. It's the same thing here for adults that are tongue-tied. They need the therapy. They need to stretch the tissue out. They need to kind before, of- Before. Before, before the, the quick frenetic, procedure. Yes. Yeah. They have to get this done. Okay, because it's the easiest clinical procedure. Yeah, every dentist has a laser, whether it's right. CO2 right, or right, diode, right. they all have Right, it. right, okay. They need the therapy. Okay. I'm taking notes. I'm lingual, taking notes. Lingual tori is a sign that they've probably been clenching. Yeah. Again, we talked about the tonsils. Again, it's yeah. going to lead to a high malum potty score. And uh, you've got two boulders in the stream. Yeah. I will I will almost guarantee a patient that they're going to have a better life. They're going to breathe better 24 hours a day if they at least get the tonsil shaped. Because some parents are against taking out the I know. tonsils. 
So shave them with a laser, yeah. leave about 10%. So there's some lymphoid tissue there, but those, those tonsils are not really clearing out any, right? Any irritants, they're being irritated. Right. In large uvula, the uvula that gets beat up, it's like a yep. punching bag, yep. right? It gets swollen. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, you know, suction from that negative pressure, but right. also when the gastric contents come up, you're gonna get inflammation. So right. someone's uvula could be really red, inflamed. Right. Really look so at those. So another things. thing to look, look at. past the teeth. Yeah. You have to look past the teeth. Got it. So this is the part we start talking about really sleep disordered breathing in children. You know, it could start with mouth breathing even before snoring. There shouldn't be noisy breathing. You should. It should be quiet in the kids' room. Tonsils and adenoids, and again, it's really before age seven. Okay. And if the kid's at risk, a lot of this is going to be, if a kid's at risk, um, I support Kevin Boyd and the Endeavor group. I want us going in there at two and a half, three. I'd like right. to get the child mainstreamed in school because the brain, this is all about the brain. Orthodontics, early intervention in this is about brain development. Right, right. Brain development. And I can't say that enough. I really am a big advocate of the brain. So again, you treat the airway, the hyperactivity gets better. We're going to talk about Connor Deegan, op the oppositional defiant disorder gets better. Uh, developmental delays get better. We can get uh, growth hormone released, better concentration. So I wet my bed till I was six. And it now everybody knows. I'm sorry, yeah. but I, when I got my tonsils and I had night terrors too. Like it was hard to do sleepover days. Talk to me. I know. We're going to have to sleep <laughs> so, later. So a, a really important point is you always hear people lecturing saying tonsils and adenoids are the biggest cause of a sleep disorder problem in right. kids. Now that's true. Okay. But? But it's multifactorial. So some kids are going to get their tonsils and adenoids out and still have a problem because of anatomy. Right. Right. They right. have an anatomical problem. And that's why orthodontics and Michael said early intervention. In my ortho program, we're seeing kids that are three, four, five, putting in bondable expanders. So the days of waiting until someone has their permanent dentition in, those days have to be done. Right. And Lane, cut. I didn't get to finish my story. I don't want you to think that, that I'm sorry. Still bed. No, no, no. <laughs> so when I had my tonsils and adenoids at at six, I stopped bedwetting the next day and I stopped having night terrors. Wait, so, say that again? When? when they opened my airway, right. when I had my tonsils taken out and my adenoids, the next day I stopped wetting my bed. I wasn't wetting my bed be for any other reason in that I was just too in a deep sleep. It had to do with my sleep apnea, which I had because right. my airway was blocked. So these parasomnias like bed wetting, night terrors, these are called parasomnias. They often go away when you open the airway, but I never got the treatment finished I never got enough expansion. And so I never really completed, I never got rid of the red. I never got rid of the Right, like Lane said, you still had the anatomical issue. Right. You took care of the soft tissue problem. Well, that's because he's a vertical I was grower. a mouth breather, but I was probably a mouth breather because I couldn't, because I had the tonsils and adenoids. I, I, and I stayed with that learning pattern. I just stayed as a mouth breather. No one converted me I get to it. a nasal breather. Right. But there's a process. But Lou, yeah. in, in terms of restorative and, and seeing people like Michael, the vertical growers, the gummy smiles, right. right? We have to recognize that a lot of those people are going to potentially have an airway or sleep issue. Right. right. It's not just like, all right, let's do some aesthetic crown lengthening and take make the essential incisors right. look better. We have to get to the root cause of you what want, caused them to do you like do that. Some, uh, are you going to do some questions? So there's two questions, one of which we're going to get to, okay. because I know we've got to get to some treatment. We got to get really to some treatment to. now. Yeah. yeah. So the first, because one of the questions is, what is the design of a proper night guard? We're getting to it. I promise you all, that's it's absolutely coming, and we do have to get there. Yeah. And it says, briefly go through the protocols of airway management again. Okay. We're going to do it right now. We're okay. Do it now. Let's do it. Okay. So look, let's go real quick. You know, snoring's not cute. So the question we always get, how long should a kid grind their teeth for? And is it normal? So everyone said, no, it's normal. Everyone should grind their teeth. 
So you want to talk about the E's and the sixes and everything? Yeah. So when I talk about climate change and grinding with parents, now some kids will grow out of that. But what I like to tell the parents are, and what we like to look at is, we look at the six year molders. So, right, like on an 11, yeah, 12 yeah, yeah. year old, do they have wear on just their first molars or do they have wear everywhere? If yeah. they have wear everywhere, they're not growing out of that. They have an airway issue. Whether That's a great it's the key tonsil- point. That's a great yeah. key point. So whether it's the tonsils and adenoids or it's in the anatomy, like I said, look at the rest of the dentition. On a 10, 11 year old, if there's just wear on those first molars, yeah, they probably grew out of it. Okay. But they start having wear on the bicuspids, on some of the anterior teeth, you need to inquire about an airway or sleep issue. Great point. Okay. Also, remember that at the time where the adenoids and the tonsils are growing and they're at their peak, yeah, it's also the peak time of brain development. And look, I'm all about brain development. So you got to get in there early enough, get the tonsils and adenoids out, make room for the tongue but get in there. That's why don't, the orthodontists wait too late to get in there. And we're gonna talk about the protocols. Okay. Um, the aha moment for Lane. Lane. So I was a restorative dentist and I sold my practice three years ago at the age of 45 to go back to doing orthodontic and craniofacial orthodontic, orthopedic residency. And I, train with all these airway people and I learned about all the signs and symptoms but the more I dug deeper I realized that orthodontics was a way to fix the problem but when I watched this which was released by the APMD it's a young boy that was diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder and ADD and he was getting shuffled around from doctor to doctor and his dentist which is Kevin Boyd recognized that his tonsils and adenoids right as well as his anatomy was preventing him from getting the proper oxygen to the brain. And Kevin really saved this kid. And after that, I said, you know what? That's it. I want to dedicate the rest of my career to helping kids and adults with sleep related breathing problems. So we don't have time to show it today. You have to watch this video. I cry every time I watch it. So it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. And it's Finding Connor Deegan. Amazing video. Okay. It is, I've seen it. So we're now we're into the patient exam. Okay. We're going to start finding these patients in the practice. You kind of know from the medical history and the signs. Yeah. So again, medical history key, questionnaire yep. key. You and I, we love comb beam, right? Lou, you do. Lane, you love comb beam. If you only have a 2D, I'm basically saying everyone should get a comb beam if you don't have a comb beam. And, and I think it's a pause. Okay. I, I have to tell you. I have not taken an FMX in eight years. Wow. I don't take FMXs. The radiation of an FMX is the same radiation as a standard dose of a CBCT in a 10 by eight. So if you go a little bit and you can catch, you can catch the airway in a 10 by eight or an 11 by nine. And if you need TM, if you need the joint, so you just take a bigger field of view, but I'm gonna just tell you, the way we're talking is most people take a cone beam to look at root canals and crowns and teeth and pathology. What do you take a comb beam for? What do you take a comb beam for? I'm looking at the TMJ, I'm right. looking at the nose, I'm looking at the airway, right? and okay. I get the teeth too. And this is not hard. This is not hard to learn how to look at, te- at the joint, at, at noses and the airway. They have softwares now, like I'm a Prexion guy and the airway just comes right up and you know if there's a restriction or not. Very easy to yeah, do it. Very so easy. We, okay, encourage, sorry. we encourage the larger field of view. So we're going to do extra oral exam, intra oral exam, airway exam, TMJ exam, orthodontics. So I always say I'm telling a story. I tell four stories. I start with the panoramic and I look at ramus heights. You fell as a kid. One ramus right. is four millimeters, six, 10 millimeters shorter. The condyle is shorter on one side. The cant of the plane, I look at aesthetics, I look at cants, but I understand a lot more about aesthetics when I look at the panoramic. Sometimes the panoramic gives me right. the most information. Absolutely. Then I look at the TMJs, which is kind of seen a little bit there on the left. Then I do my 3D view, mm-hmm. which is gonna show me the airway. Mm-hmm. And the, that's right. a beautiful picture with right. a soft tissue. And then we go into the uh, sections, axial, coronal, 
uh, we go to, in, into all the sections. Got it. So you love this slide lane, right? I do. So the target number that we look for on a cone beam is 120 millimeters squared. So anything below that, we're really thinking the person might have a problem. Now, people could argue, well, the person's standing up right. and they're awake. Right. Now, it is pathognomonic for having a problem. Right. And, you know, Michael and I always talk about, people talk on the lecture circuit about a coffee straw and a McDonald's straw or a garden hose. Now, I agree that's the anatomy. Right. But there's also the physiology. So if I told you that a coffee straw and a McDonald's straw, but the McDonald's straw was paper, you also have to think about collapsibility. Mm -hmm. So it can't just be black and white. It has to be physiology right. as well as anatomy. So, and, yeah, and I like looking at the vertebrae of the neck. Look, I've got a Vodtech. My unit goes down right. to C7. Right. So I say I get down as far as anyone in North America. I'm seeing a lot of scoliosis. But Bill, <laughs> I, give, I give Bill Hang a lot of credit. Coffee stir and the patients love it. Coffee stir, straw, garden hose. What's my goal? I want to give you the airway of a garden hose. And they get it. And it's so simple. Your life's going to be better if you have a larger. And you need the tone, like you said, from the myofunctional therapy. But a takeaway on this is you're also looking at the spine because the spine could be telling you signs that there's something also wrong with the airway. Correct? And I work with a physical therapist. 75% okay. of my patients are also seeing a physical therapist that is an airway centric physical therapist. Wow. And that's a great point because a lot of these people, they're postured forward. Right. Right. And, and you see it in kids when we take steps, they're posturing forward to open their airway. And Michael and I talk about it. If, if I told them to lean their head back over their shoulders, right. they would, they'd suffocate. They'd right. die. They'd close their airway. Open. Right. And by okay. the way, what no one talks about, what is the back border of the airway? The cervical spine. Right. So we have to partner with the physical therapist because, and my guys are doing diaphragm work, breathing, pressure gradients. And it's, this is where it becomes fun. Because when I have, they come into my office once a week for two to three hours, it's a great way of co-treating. And so look, my dad, you know, before he stopped, right before he stopped practicing, he goes, Michael, I, this is, I used to take transcranials on all our patients. Then I got the quinsectograph. I don't even know what that is. Don't even, we don't have time. Keep Listen, going. look at, so when we look at the TMJ and I see the TMJ's bone on bone is, is rearmost, uppermost, yeah. the, the old def, uh, definition, right. I know that there's something up. And so I'm trying to align these data sets. I align the data set of my medical history, the chief complaint, mm -hmm. the comb beam and the home sleep test. And I'm aligning that in my brain, I'm lining up paper. And that's what we're teaching is how to align this. So I came up with, and I don't think it's heresy, but I actually benefit so much from spending 28 years with my dad and he was all TMJ. And I realized my dad would go to a fatigue conference right? and he would say, the reason we get rid of the fatigue is I treated the TMJ, the internal derangement. And what serendipitously, I used to worry. I oh, told I you, get it. Now. Right. Well, my dad was bringing the jaw down and forward. And I said, what if they prove my dad is wrong? What if everyone should be rearmost, uppermost? Because he was being right. told that they, right. he should quit. Of and course. He should. Right. When you bring the jaw down and forward, so you see the disc is a little displaced, the condyle, the jaw is yes. back. If you bring the jaw down and forward, you know what it does? It opens, it the, opens airway the airway because the tongue is attached to the genial tubercle. So as you bring the jaw down and forward, serendipitously, they wake up in the morning, they feel better because deeper sleep, more oxygen, which is my, it's my recipe. History of centric relation. This is us going back to the Equilibration Society, Chicago. This is going back to our roots. Dentistry was always a retractive profession, going back to B.B. McCollum, Stewart and Stallard back at USC Hall of Fame, 1924, when they first put the jaws, the study cast onto an articulator, they had to have a reproducible position. What they didn't realize at that time, it wasn't, physio it wasn't correct physiologically. Right. And we had those battles in dentistry for years. And then Dawson finally in 1982, 1985, the glossary of prosthodontic terms changed and Dawson now went to an anterior superior position. 
Frank Salenza talked about long centric even before that. And then Gelb and Farah were, were down and forward against the eminence in roughly the same. And Barney Jenkelson, what I was saying, the neuromuscular guys were basically in the same position. So this kind of gives you history. A lot of academies like the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, they will finish an ortho case or a restorative case anywhere between concentric and they happen to like Gelb 47. So I don't know if you have any comments, questions. I, I mean, no, I, tell me. I, I, I spent, we argue this all the time. I yeah. spent my world in CR. I know, right? and you start, so did I. No, but sit, think about it. I would put a patient in CR. No one wants to stay in CR. We're closing their airway off. So a lot of these patients that you put them in CR, right? You don't start someone there. I would always say it's like putting training wheels on a bicycle. It's a great starting point. But at the end of the day, the patients are going to want to posture forward. They're going to want to posture out of that. But how many guys, Lane, they say to me, Gelb, you screw up every bite. So we're taught in dental school, I think, Lou, that the back teeth are always supposed to touch. Right. But who says, what if we have a narrow face like Nestor talks about, like Coricini talks about, like Western Price? What if everything... Yeah, but the point is this. We spoke about it. Your teeth should touch for 20 minutes a day. You need to breathe for 1,440 minutes. I know. So for so long, I would mount a case or articulate them. I deprogram them. And I, I missed. I missed it. So again, airway first, treatment plan. Yeah. yeah. Airway this trust. is disruption, and that's why we're all. Yeah. This is uncomfortable. Pick up the pace. Let's go. So GELP 47, that's a lower splint. So you're going to find out that I treat with a lower appliance during the day because I deal with headaches. I deal with neck pain. I deal with what at least 40% of your patients have. So Lou, the way that Michael and I kind of got together was in my ortho program, I noticed that a lot of the patients that were skeletal class two, their mandibles were back, were having CMD problems. And I reached out to Michael and he said, come in because I wanted to see what he was doing. And I realized what he does with his lower gelb is what we do with bite block therapy in ortho, where we're guiding someone's mandible down and forward, getting them into a better position. And then from that point, a lot of times we're proclining their incisors and stabilizing their occlusion that way. So before you go on, is the traditional gelb appliance then, I know it's a lower appliance, but is the idea then you're building up the posterior plane, so you're moving it all down and forward? Just tell everybody briefly. We now cover the cuspids. Okay, you so now cover the cuspids. Now you have to cover the cuspids. Okay, so I absolutely. actually, I modified you did my modify dads. That. I had to, right? because you're trying to avoid any intrusion. So I covered the cuspids. Right. I put in natological principles like cuspid guidance. Okay. I wrap the acrylic around, not just the lingual bar. I don't want to get any movement of the anterior teeth. Okay. And they always, they would use this typically for the day for six weeks to eight weeks. Then for Pilates, yoga, midterms and finals, weightlifting. And then it goes with a nighttime. We're going to discuss right. the night guard. The part two. With the part so two. this is then, as we had discussed, also a deep programmer. It's a deep program for the day. It's actually relaxing the muscles, reminding them not to clench. It's a biofeedback device. It's reminding them to keep their lips together, teeth apart. So it does cognitive behavioral therapy while it decompresses the joints and lengthens the muscle and relaxes the muscles and okay. stabilizes the neck. So classic case, Lane, this is your this is your career. Yeah, this was my career for so long. Woman came in like this, she'd want a broader smile. What would I do? I'd build her out with veneers. Of course. I'd fill in those buckle right. corridors, but I missed her real problem. She had that narrow maxilla, right. that high vaulted palate, and I'd veneer her case. Mm -hmm. And then after veneering her case, I'd make her an upper flat plane night guard. Right. So now I took away like tongue we all space, do. right? I took away tongue space. I probably made her airway even worse. And I probably drove her mandible Got back. It. And that's what Michael talks about is if you just open up vertical on someone, their mandible is going to rotate clockwise. You're going to close off their airway. So the beauty of the lower gelb and the repositioner is you're guiding them down and forward and you're really opening up their airway. The, the mandible dictates airway dynamics. Right. Where their, oh, air, where their mandible without is a doubt. Yeah. dictates where their airway right. is. And, but it's prevented from sometimes going far enough forward because of the maxilla needs to be developed. Definitely. It ends up that she would have Which to take- Which is a key point. Right? She'd yeah. have to take something to go to sleep every night. Benadryl, Unison, NyQuil, alternating. Like so many patients that are fit, 
so many very thin, fit women exhausted all the time for problems with insomnia. And, but but she needs restorative, she needs. right? She's going to need restorative right. after. It's just a matter of setting this case up, expanding her, and then doing the veneers. Because she she's going to end up chipping this. If you leave her like this, she did with that now maxilla. She is. Well, and you never found the root of the problem. Exactly. Right. That was the problem. That's yeah. the problem. Okay. So this is trying to tell us, and we're going to move along a little bit. The patient comes in, remind you, the patient comes in driven by pain. The patient that never comes in say, oh, Lou, I've got an airway problem. Um, I, saw, I saw this. Now, if they've read the book Breath, if they've read the book Gasp, they will come in asking for an airway appliance. Right. And they'll come in asking for ortho. But they usually come in because they have pain on chewing, they're clenching, they've broken a restoration. They really have an airway problem. And when you have a woman like this, who she's not overweight, she doesn't have a terrible arch form. No. But when you take the cone beam, it's only 79.2 millimeters squared. And I say to myself, I better get a sleep test. And she had moderate sleep apnea. Here's a case that we love. Again, patient comes in because they're tired, because they come in when they're in pain. Patient comes in, we end up doing a, and she's irritable and she's depressed. She ended up, and look at that mandible, and look at that max, look at the narrative. She's the classic case. You want to say, she's an upper two bicuspid. Yeah, I, I spent an hour and a half in my ortho program discussing this case with the residents, because this case was my bread and butter as a restorative dentist, right? right? right. As a general dentist. All right, yeah, you know what? She has some large amalgams, she needs crowns. But you could see here, she's almost in crossbite. She has a severe overbite. She's a bicuspid extraction case. She has a high vaulted palate. Yeah. You know, she looks tired. If you look at her profile picture, she almost has no chin. She has no chin. Wow. Right? She has that yeah. retruded mandible. So that's why we want to talk to not only the dentist, but the front desk person, the hygienist. When you see this person, let the dentist know, you know what? I think Mrs. Jones might have an airway or sleep problem. And she's developing that dowager's hump. Now, we did a sleep study. She had 69 events. You're gonna see our treatment. So look at that airway, almost no airway. 69 look, events per, per hour. hour. Oh my God. Severe, so she's severe, as, the, she's as severe. it gets. We got it down yeah. to eight. She had 365 DSATs between 4% and 9, 110 between 10% and 20%. We brought it oh down. My God. We brought it down, I think, to 12 and 0. And so this is the after. Now, what happens? Do you notice how her head posture is tilted back? Her head's an extension. Yes. Do you notice she has no chin? Look at the cut line. Look at we're able to give her somewhat of a chin. Yep. This is non-surgical. Do you notice how her ear has moved back? You notice how her head- Oh, it's almost upright. Do you know how her head's back into better, possible right. better flexion? Yes. She's gonna have less of that hump. Do you see how the hump is half the size now? So the head's going into yeah. flexion. Yeah. The mandibles come forward. We haven't done anything in the maxilla. She's about to start orthodontics. She's thrilled. Her life is transformed. So let me, so I'm clear here. She's about to start orthodontics. But what you've done first is taking care of her sleep and Let's her see. airway. This is what I did. Got it. Let's I take put a in look. a lower during the day. Right. Brought her down and forward. Right. So this picture is taken with the lower device in. Okay. She wears it during the day as needed. When she drives, when she's under stress. She wears the prosomnus device at night because it's adjustable and titratable to keep her airway open while she sleeps. I'm managing her day, her pain complaints, and I'm managing her airway at night. It's combined treatment. So, Mike, and I know we we have a time issue. No, but go ahead. Go back to the gelb. How much vertical do you know to open? If you're not doing kind of neuromuscular, like my partner Tony does, how do you know how much, how, you know what I'm saying? You see how the upper incisors were trapping her back. Yes, yes, I do. I have to say, I've got to escape that. Okay because that was keeping me too retro. Got it. So really we know that she's got to come out like this. Okay. But she's so retro that I had to almost go edge to edge because I had no airway. So do you guide the lab for that? Oh, I take the bite. So 66, 
Mississippi. So my dad used to say the sibilant. Of course. The S sound. So 66. So usually when you say the sibilant, it's going to guide you into that more anterior Beautiful. position. Beautiful. Great pearl. And it's great yeah. to use. The other the other thing is. And then you're just taking the bite laterally. And then just, I fill in exactly. laterally. Okay. Fill okay. In. Okay. Just making sure we're all so, getting this. So Lou, the other yeah. thing is, because this question comes up a lot. Well, if this woman comes in, could you just put her right into ortho? Right, and that's a valid point. But the patients that are coming into Michael's office, a lot of them are having acute issues and a lot of right. them are having sleep and airway issues. So obviously I'm an orthodontist now, I'm all about doing ortho, but you have to address their acute problems and then put them into ortho. I think that's a really good point. Get them out of pain, get them sleeping and feeling better and then get them into the ortho. Right, and that's our TAO, TAO, TMJ airway then ortho. So I think this is a great case before her airway is 38.5 after, and she still has got a way to, and that's the bite that she's in with the prosomus appliance on the bottom. You can got see it. how protrusive. Oh, I think it's a very important thing for everybody to see that. Yeah. So that's the treatment position. And again, I, I'm limited because she hasn't had ortho yet. That area should get much bigger. She should be in the 250 to 300 range when we're done. And so daytime then she takes out her night appliance and has to be still in the gelb appliance to keep her, otherwise she's just going to go back but remember what lane said i also taught her cognitively behaviorally right. to keep her teeth apart 98 percent of the time so she can go longer and longer and right. longer without, without it. Gelb. got it i don't want them okay. to get reliant on my right. appliance so here's the sequence hygienist plays a key role in healthcare. we like to call them the physicians right. the oral PA, the physician's right. assistant. You pick it up, dentist picks it up, you do that exam, you look at the medical history, you either do impressions or a scan, you're gonna order a sleep test, or we're gonna tell you, or a polysomnogram, you're gonna work with an MD who's gonna interpret it, letter of medical necessity. They're gonna come up with a diagnosis, you'll agree. You give them the treatment options, CPAP, and this is what it's about. What do they need? In yep. the United States, we're very CPAP heavy. In Europe, it's more 50% oral devices, 50% CPAP. There's ENT, like you said, but again, you've already been through two failed surgeries. Right. So we're gonna pick and choose. Go back. So I want to, I just think this is a key point. I'm a dentist, I have three hygienists. Yeah. Okay. In my practice, if we're going to identify this dentist hygienist in the exam, I am making the appointment for the patient to come back and do the impressions and do all of this. There is no way I'm asking anybody out there to do same day all of this. We know that hour is so tight on time with the hygienist. This is a second appointment. I mean, to me, I think you've got to bring them back and do all this. By the way, I had to, I bought another, an extra scanner. Right. Because I had so many people that needed to get and forget the impression. Yeah. I like to go with digital with, if I to can. show them. But I'm scheduling an hour and a half right. to, because it's a three thousand dollar. It's worth it yeah. because you're changing their life. Right. Get them back for the hour. It's easier than I doing couldn't a agree. crown. You agree? And, I mean, and, and don't and, rush because now everybody's waiting in the hygienist distress. Don't right. rush. You know, exactly. hire an associate or I have a team member, by the way, key point. 90% of this is team driven, right. not Michael Gelb right. driven, not dentist driven. So CPAP's one option, right, Lane? Yeah, I, I love CPAP and I think it's a great tool. However, compliance is the big issue with this. Right. You know, and now obviously with, there's been a big recall through Philips for a lot of their CPAPs. Yeah. We're getting calls from patients that they're gonna be without their CPAP for three, four months. And that's where something like the Prosan, this that oral appliance therapy is really gonna help so many of these people. So, you know, surgery, it's basically 50-50. So they stop doing this U triple P, they call it the rotor rooter. They basically don't do it so much because at 50%, you might as well flip a coin. It wasn't really reliable. Wow, just 50%. That's all you got. And then, you know, you can do the maxillomandibular advancement surgery. And sometimes you need to do that. 10 to 14 millimeters right. of advancement. But if you get in to do a kid like Kevin does, it's basically doing MMA on a kid without a surgery. Right, as they go into Because the bone's like butter, the right. bone moves so easily, but right. you gotta get in there early. Lane, appliances. So there's a hundred FDA approved oral appliances. And this is a great adjunct 
but I worked at an ENT office and I was putting in appliances and I had a 25 year old guy who had moderate sleep apnea and he asked me the question, he's like, Lane, do I have to wear these, one of these for the rest of my life? And I said, not if I could help it. I mean, we need to do better. How do you give a 25 year old an adjunct for 60 years? Right. Agreed. This is a big problem. So, so much of what we do in medicine and dentistry is fixing symptoms. We have the opportunity as dentists to really fix the problem. And we talk about right. orthodontics and there's so many different ways to do it, but grow, grow the airway. We have that capability to well, do that. We're going that. to talk about that in a second, but yep. let, there's the T part, the TMJ, the day, there's the airway. And look, if I got a 65 year old, 60 year old guy, they're going to be happy. I've changed their Hello. life. They may not right. want to do the ortho. Part. Absolutely. If I have a 40 year old guy, it's 50, 60 years, then 30, definitely 25. A kid definitely is going to have ortho. So we're more and more open now to grow in the airway, but I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I agree. And I think a lot of this is if we're going to grow the airway, a lot of it then is we're, instead of doing the veneers, I hate to say this, if we're expanding and bleaching, you've got come up with a much more conservative Definitely. technique. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, okay. I would love to do four veneers rather than doing 10. Of course. It's a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, it's unfortunate that 90% of the patients are actually getting their airway closed. 50 right. to 90, they're getting, so we, we've got to stop. I mean, we've said that three times. Yeah. I think we've got to stop using the primitive night guard and go to what we call so let's, NG2, so this, NG squared. Right, so this is really, the key point here when people, well, what kind of mouth guard? We've gone into the Gelb appliance, the day appliance. I think it's how we do the combination here. So let's walk everybody through. Beautiful. This. So Lane and I came up with this design. Uh, you know, Bill Farrow was very helpful. But you know, that real estate on the maxilla, that's valuable real estate because that's going to block the tongue. Anything that blocks the tongue, anytime you make that maxilla narrower with an appliance, it's going to shove the tongue back. So this is really minimal. The beautiful thing about how, what would you say, Lane? It's just not bulky. It's yeah. not taking up. And a lot of, of those space. appliances that Michael showed, the oral appliances, it, they're bulky. They're not comfortable. It's not necessarily a one size fits all. And that's what we've tried to create, right? We've tried to create an appliance where every single dentist could make it for every single one of their patients that walks in. It's gonna fit them, it's gonna be comfortable, it's not gonna open up their vertical, they're gonna be able to get lip sealed, they're gonna be able to breathe through their nose. Right, so if you wanna know where to make these, you can contact us. Um, we've got one lab making them now, uh, which is Great Lakes, which made this one. Yeah. And then uh, you can also keep contacting us. So we love talking about work, plan, sleep. I mean, it's a term that's used by right. occupational right. therapists. But remember, you're gonna use it when you work. Some people, when they're concentrating, when they're stressed out, someone who's right. writing a brief or something, they'll can use it during play sports, uh, contact sports. Anytime they could clench, they're gonna weightlifting definitely. And of, of course, wearing it for sleep. So I love talking about the, the NG2 promises. How about if we could make a night guard Lou and the patient could wake up being refreshed? Yeah. What if you could wake up in a better mood with a night guard? What if you could wake up with no snoring with a night guard? And what if you could wake up with no clicking, popping, or locking in the jaw? Now, th this also promotes nasal breathing and proper lip and tongue posture, and it's comfortable. It's not bulky. This is what I would expect from every night guard in the country. If you're going to make a night guard, I think you've got to live up to these promises. You have to try to aspire for these promises. I would agree. This is a high standard. And that's set. moving from the maxillary flat plane. Yes. Where patients, uh, honestly, they're, they're not gonna... waking up any differently. They're no. not in any better mood. I'm not stopping their snoring. Exactly. You do prevent uh, tooth breakage, though. I will give you, you that. Do. You and, do. And, and yeah. some muscle and tension tightness. and yes. tightness. You do. you do. I'm not disagreeing with you. So now we're talking about, before we get into like the how and why you should do this, uh, Lane talked about growing the airway. You know, look, Vivos is doing it, yep. Compliments, Vivos, uh, Facial Beauty is doing it. Uh, you can do it with Invisalign, Ben, ben talks about that. Um, what else, Lane, what are the different expanders, Lane, your program with yeah. Alakani, you're doing Yeah, it. and we're agnostic on the ortho side. No, I know. Right, like 
as long as you're going to do it. And, and Michael brought up a great point. The 40 to 50 to 60 year old, they might not want to do art. Though. So at least get them in an appliance that's going to help them, help their airway, you know, help them feel better. Obviously, I'm in an ortho program, so I do love this concept of growing the airway, but it's really the comfort level of every dentist, right? If someone's doing clear aligner therapy, it's just my, maybe a little bit of modifying their treatment plan. If they do functional appliances, they can do something like Vivos, they can do a traditional high risk expander, or they can do a combination. So when you're ready, we're going to show you kind of the how to get involved with it. This is like the icing on the cake. So you will transform your practice, um, certainly with airway friendly orthodontics, but just by recognizing the type of night guard you should do. Right. Let's start with the easy right. stuff, the low hanging fruit. Agreed. But we love airway friendly orthodontics. We love intervening early, especially for a kid who's at risk. Um, orthodontics has a lot of power. We want them to use their their knowledge and their talent for good. We want them to open the airway. Uh, we, we prefer no more four by cuspid extractions. It's obviously a team approach and I want to get into it. So this is one of the big breakthroughs we've had. And I think- I love of, this. This is yeah. very exciting. So for the first time, we've got this disposable unit. What do we mean? So my problem was I would give out a five, $6,000 machine. I couldn't get it back. For, I had to send letters, threatening letters. <laughs> I had to take their credit cards, but it would cost me 6,000 a machine. This we can do for the dental office. You give it to the patient, you initialize it. The data comes back through the cloud. So they download an app. It's very simple and we get all the data we need to be able to. And it's all the done via a watch. It's a watch. It's, it's a watch. It it's a watch. So no, no more of this. Nothing on your face, no, no to fill in, nothing on your forehead. So the patient's now coming back to you for the appointment you made in hygiene and you'll have this data. And they'll go, yeah, we'll either give it to them that day in right. hygiene. Okay. And no, I'll get it through the internet the second they finish the test, I'm getting it and it's going to the physician. I'm getting the interpretation by the Got time it. they come back. Of course. Within like 48 to 72 okay. hours. So that's right. Anything you want to say more about the watch pad link? No, the next slide covers a lot of what we're talking about in terms of the patient comes in, they have an exam and Michael and I in our program really dissect patients that are acceptable to give a home sleep test to that day or patients that might need to go to the know, hospital, go to the hospital, right, have an inlet right. study. Those yeah. are the patients with periodic leg movements, history of severe cardiovascular comorbidities, you know, the AFib, they have stents. The other patients though, which is probably about 80% of the people right. that have the wear, that have the high vaulted palate, that could be more refreshed. We want the hygienist to give them a home sleep test on almost all those patients. Make it part of the protocol. So, yes. So let me ask this watch test. Yeah. Okay. So are the watches like at your office? Just walk, because nobody knows this. So, so we're just asking. We're gonna we're gonna give you 12 at a time or you could start up right. with three or four. We show them the watch. There's one probe where it goes into one finger. Okay. It's very advanced technology okay. out of Israel. And they walk home, they do it that night or the next night, right. the data comes back. So we have them in the office. There's nothing like giving the patient the Got test it. right at hygiene Agree. to take home with so, them. So Agree. there's no medical, okay. there's no insurance. You Got brought it. up, no matter, you, right. you brought, I, that's my next point. Right. When you ask people about sleep, and we ask you that, there are so many obstacles for someone to get treated, right? right? Here, you need a, a sleep test. Well, all right, my insurance has to cover it. I have to wait for the verification of benefits. Then the physician needs to read it. Then you need to get a letter of medical necessity. It could take three months for someone to get treated. This way, we've really expedited it. Hand the patient the sleep test. Our board certified sleep physician is reading it. And then they're going to get a letter of medical necessity. They're either going to get prescribed a CPAP based on their severity right. or an oral appliance. And but, the NG2 is really the solution for us got it. moving forward. And by the way, a patient like we just saw that had the two bicuspids who was 69, we got her down to eight. Right. She's a dental candidate, even though she was severe, severe, yes, severe. Yeah, she's still a dental. We, she was an iatrogenic case. We right. had screwed her up by pulling everything back. So the fix can often be orthodontic. Can got be it, dental. yeah. So I'd say 80% of the cases that are your snores, your milds, your moderates, that's what we want to treat. 
And just the practicality, let's say you have a practice with 2000 patients. We're telling you that 50% of the people in hygiene, in restorative, 50% of your patients are airway patients. Let's say if the combined case is $3,000, okay? Which is a very, it's a reasonable I think it's a price. reasonable, right. right. So it's 3 million in revenue. You wanna do the 3 million over four years, you wanna do it. You're not gonna do everything in one year. You're not gonna do no. 2,000 because you're just starting no, out. Right. That's right. right. So if you did, let's say a quarter, let's say you did uh, 250, uh, 250 right. it's 750 K in revenue. Your team's excited. It's going to help the practice. And by the way, they're going to need restorative afterwards. They're going to need orthodontics. This is just the first part. And this is the potential, I think, win, win, win. I, I do. I, I really am. I just think this is such a home run. And today, I think one of the keys was, is if you really understand how you can identify these in your practice, which we have done, I think very well, both on anatomy yes. and medical history. Now it's getting the whole team behind you. And I think when we close today on that, we really need to talk about expanded learning, expanded yes. learning yes, and the opportunity to get the whole team involved. It's, it's 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 not like ABC, but, but it is a process that we can right. show them. And yeah. we're going to have an intermediate course that I think we right. go over this in more depth. Right. Uh, I would treat the team first. I would get the whole team studied. I would give a home sleep test to every one of my team. I agree. Yeah, that's the way. I mean, I like to do it. Yeah. So we have this thing called the Tau method. So Lane came. It's a great name. I think it's TMJ which is based on my dad's stuff, which right, is great. Right, right. Airway, which is what I've been doing right. over 30 years. Right. And Lane has introduced the orthodontic part, which is a way of growth, fixing, getting at really the root cause. So airway is root cause right. for anxiety, for depression, for ADD. But if you really don't want to wear a device the rest of your life, we got to do the ortho. fact that we could do ortho. Guys like us, 500 square foot apartment, right. I'm doing it. Lane's doing it. I've got my device here. You know, I'm 64. I'm trying to grow my airway. I got to do it. I know and you're going to, I know. It. So we want to support the team. So the question is we've come up with a learning management system. Okay. We've been spending the last six months to nine months doing that. So the team can go into this learning that it's how the kids are learning. Yeah. It's online learning. Um, we hold the hand, we keep the team accountability we get a champion in the office that can champion, let's say the sleep test. And as I said, this is team driven. So it's really a matter of really managing and really helping the team master this. And where do they go I, again? And this is, I mean, we've given a great amount of information yeah. for everybody to expand sleep airway right. and ortho in their course. Where do we go to find out more? Yeah. I'd say if you go to GPS for dental.com, and just click on that start now button or uh, on the screen. And that's just for more information. Yeah, you talk to someone, they'll look at your yep. practice, see what yep. might be good for your practice. Yep. How many associates do you have? How many dentists, how many team members? Because like I said, I want the team to really be doing most of this. I mean, anyone who's got kids, Anyone who cares about ADD, about kids development, the development of their brain, anyone that has a father that might be going through me and dad with dementia or Alzheimer's, I don't want to get dementia or Alzheimer's. So inflammation, getting a good night's sleep is really paramount for me. So, so I hear you. So okay. Pointed questions. Okay, you want to say something before I, I, I go? I want to say something more to the restorative and general dentist that- Okay, say the, talk to him, no, no, not the, to me. Well, I want to talk to you because you're the general and restorative dentist too, but the low hanging fruit are the night guards, right? Yes. It's not necessarily the, the sleep appliances. So, so many dentists that are watching this are making night guards. Yes. And right. so many of those patients that they're making night guards for really have an airway and sleep issue. And that's kind of the paradigm shift. Correct. Got it. Ready for questions from the so, audience sure. before mine. Okay. Hold on, hang on, I am going. Okay, first off, there's a comment. 
I love and use Xclear regularly, and it's good. It's good to fight COVID too. Yes. So there are studies that yes. iodine sprays and Xclear both. So I'm a user of the iodine, but I couldn't agree more. It's a really great thing for everybody on Xclear. Love both. I do too. Is there a correlation with thumb sucking and airway? Comfort maybe. Thumb sucking so and airway. I I think it's a preservation technique. I think it's like having a tongue thrust as well. Okay. Right? They're subconsciously posturing forward and the thumb sucking is really helping them open their airway. So I definitely think there's a correlation. Okay, so something to, again, identify seeing young patient. Is there an age limit to getting a phrenectomy or a tongue tie? No. No. Great. Retronathic patients with retruded mandibles and an eight to 10 millimeter overjet. What are options if the patient can't afford VSSO? Are there any ortho or myofunctional treatments to increase growth of the mandible? And if so, what age would be the most crucial and desirable? I'd like to ask you that question. I think as young as possible. Okay. You know, for the really young kids, we're using lip bumpers, we're guiding their mandible forward. Um, for adults, we're using things like bite block therapy, which is really, you could use like a lower gelb appliance, kind of remodel the condyle, really bring their mandible down and forward, really helps out the ortho. We did it actually on my friend's son with those sleep appliance, same premise, brought their mandible down and forward. Okay, good. I totally agree. Bring them forward, keep them there, get them used neuromuscularly and they will often stay forward. They don't want to go back. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot of people don't understand that that question. That's a good question. And I think a lot of times as a restorative dentist, I did this a lot in my practice. I didn't know better, but I trapped a lot of people back. Right. I did veneers. I tried to correct class threes. With okay, veneers you're done. Or, or Next. Okay. Break. Sorry. Thank you, Andrew. That was a great question. Next question. How soon can you see positive changes in kids after removing tonsils or myofunctional therapy? How soon? I think a lot of times Michael alluded to it. I think you could see it immediately. Now it's, it's not going to resolve it completely on right. some kids with an anatomical problem, right. but I think a lot of those kids, they're going to get better immediately. Two weeks. Once the inflammation goes down, the swelling yep. goes down, it's two to three weeks. Absolutely. But within two yeah. to three weeks, you really start to see, I think a huge difference. And then you have to be looking at the anatomy as part two. Now that they need it, ortho. So 50% right. of the kids Tell will us. need expansion. Got it. It's, that's a study. 51% failed. You got to do both. Great tip. Got to do both. Great, great tip. How do I get my front office team member trained to identify these clues? How do I get my, my dental hygienist trained? Now, I'm just going to say this. Michael and Lane did not come up here to do a promotional video and a promotional course. But I know what I want to do with my team in Chicago. So I do think for the team to get really trained, Mike, Lane, I know you offer a course. Does it involve the full team training? Yeah, and it's run by really a hygienist. So it's really meant as much for the team or maybe more for the team than I'd say, because they can go back and they can watch it. It's a very, I'd say, basic level. We wanted to keep this simple. We're not trying to overcomplicate this. So I'd say definitely for the team. Okay. so. That's the answer there. And this is a really good question too from Tanashi. Do you ever worry about posterior open bites? Uh, I think it's a great question. Well, it's always been the down, you know, people have been criticizing me. I know. Because when I bring the jaw down and forward, I get a posterior open bite. Um, again, I'm trying to open the airway and I'm trying to take the pressure up the TM joints. I think patients love it. The only one that's really uh, disturbed is the dentist because they don't get, they don't understand. But alluding to that point, if the patient, you bring them down and forward, depending on what type of orthodontic therapy you're trained in, you could procline their incisors and kind of resolve that. Yeah. You know, you just don't want to leave them back, right? Because right. think about it. That's what Invisalign, when people do IPR, you're retracting them. When you take out four by cuspids, you're doing, you're doing retractive orthodontics. Right. You don't want to close their airway. Right. Our whole message is open the airway. They're going to be better and healthier. Right. 
I'm, I'm not arguing. The teeth to touch 20 minutes a day. Right. You need to breathe for 1,440 we, we minutes. Ju we just did a, a, a full mouth, my partner did, because she ended up creating a, post a huge posterior open bite that she was totally unaware of but her sleep was 100% better. So informed consent is a huge yeah, part of that. Yeah. If you're class two dip two, I guarantee you're gonna create a posterior open bite. Just know it going in, they'll think you're a genius and then tell them there might and, be orthodontics needed. And, and a good point to that is a lot of times the skeletal class two patients yes. do that are trapped back. You'll hear the dentist talk about, well, we're gonna put in a morning aligner a, a, in, right. or a deprogrammer. Right. Deep programmer. The problem is, you're, you're bringing them forward Hello, and you're, all night, right, and then all of a sudden in the morning, right. you're gonna be like, you know what, we're gonna push you back. Do you really wanna push them back? No. And you're closing their airway. Right. So Michael and I talk about it as, as much as I like to make morning reprogrammers, sometimes I don't, I want their bite to change. Right. So, it's always a dilemma. So now it really gets back to a couple of things. Um, how do you address bite changes? So I think one of the things is, is we've talked about the fact that now we're, putting them in a lower gel or putting them yes. at nighttime. Right. And now all of a sudden we could be changing their bite. And ultimately we're going to want to do ortho on these patients. But Lane taught me, I now give most patients an AM aligner made of those beads, the uh, yeah. thermoplastic, yeah. thermoplastic beads, thermocryl. They're great. It's very small. They can bite on it for 30 seconds. It's really radically improved my practice a lot less headaches, patient can chew. And then if they want to move ahead with ortho, they can, but I don't get those phone calls. You ruin my bite. I can't chew. I'm in pain. So it's kind of a hedge. Okay. Um, ethically, I explained to the patient my ethical, I don't really want to push them back, but I want them to be able to chew in their, right. in their bite that they came in with, even though it needs to probably be changed. Got it. Okay. Um, tongue tied. Seems that that would limit the tongue from falling back to block the airway. Jeremy is always, we're always scared sometimes in these certain individuals that if we relieve the tongue tie without the myofunctional, the tongue is going to fall back. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was Carol's question. So I think that's a legitimate question. Yeah. And, and I'll leave that to, you know, the dentist. What, what would you say on that? I think this is where the myofunctional therapist right. and the myofunctional therapy is so vital for these people. Right. You have to it's get their point. tongue trained. It's a, yeah. And it's a, it's a great, great question. point, Carol. It's yeah. a great question. Very good. And that's why in dentistry, right? Everyone wants to just jump in and do procedures. They need the therapy first. Okay, sorry. There's just a few more questions still coming in. Um, how long did it take for your patient to move from 38 and a half millimeters to 126 millimeters during your management? I could have taken that film probably in the first month or the first two weeks. Right. So that's with it in it's like a stent. It's going to stay open. Right. It's not permanent because she has to wear something at night. We haven't changed the tissue. She hasn't done myofunctional. So that's almost immediate that you're going right. to get that effect. Right. Immediate. Immediate. Right. Yeah. The tongue's attached to their mandible. You bring their mandible forward, their tongue is coming forward. It's not going to obstruct their airway right. as much. I go, if I come forward, it gets rid of the snoring. So is there a patient device that they can use as an ongoing SATS or RDI? Do you know what that means? It's from, yeah, I don't know. It's from Steven. Is there a patient device that they can use as an ongoing SATS or RDI? Do you know what that oh, means? Oh, they're talking about their saturations and RDI. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Well, the ongoing device is, it's the airway device that Lane showed 10 of them. Right. We use prosomnus, uh, we use Great Lakes, but uh, we use a lot of prosomnus. And uh, every night that they wear that device, it's gonna cut down on the DSATs and it's gonna lower the RDI. And then obviously they can use the watch to evaluate the triturate, right? We didn't say that. So okay. again, they're gonna Sorry. do a follow-up right. sleep test. Right. We, we had a call with Joel yesterday. We can send them another probe they can keep that disposable unit in their house. We'll send them another probe in, let's say, a month to two to three months. They'll do the follow-up, make sure that we have efficacy. And, and another point is that, obviously, we're looking a lot at the sleep test. We're looking at desaturations, but 
we're also focused on what's causing the obstruction. Right. No, right. right. That's, that's yeah. really the key here. And There's something causing that thing. It's not, you know, it's not called desaturation breathing problem. It's called obstruction, right. obstructive breathing problems. Is there an epigenetic technology? Is epigenetic technology realistic? You don't have to answer that to upset the groups. Do you understand the question? Is epigenetic technology realistic? It's kind of the, the vivos, right? right. And Dave well, Singh talking that, about yeah. epigenetics. And right. I think that there's validity in it, right. right? Because, you know, you see a lot of the studies on identical twins. And, you know, one twin was a mouth breather and the other wasn't. And they look completely different as adults. Right. So I, I think there's a lot of validity in that and a lot yeah. of validity in what these other programs are doing. Um, and what is the minimum age that you start assessing the airway on a patient and do you see this in the pediatric population so minimum age on a patient what does kevin go to two 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 three karen, four karen bonnick first year of life first so year she of life. says that you can have irreversible brain changes even in the first year of life that means breastfeeding tongue tie you've got to address it at birth okay great can. great great point to bring up yeah. again Okay, um, I've always made my quote unquote primitive night guards on the lower arch because I find patients are more comfortable with their tongues able to rest on their palate. Is this helping or hurting the airway issue? We prefer the lower arch, but it's helping. They're smart because uh, they're not taking up that valuable real estate. A right. lot of people prefer the gaggers. A lot of people prefer lower full coverage as opposed to uppers. But, but also, a lower is better, but taking it with the phonetic bite, like Michael was talking about, where you're guiding the mandible down and forward and not just leaving them in kind of like a center of occlusion position. So you need that protrusion. Yeah. And you can only get that combining the upper with the lower, sometimes with hooks and rubber bands. Right. So, so you've got to guide them forward. Right. So I think going back to your key point, just to repeat, because I love repeating, if they're doing their phonetics, at Mississippi, yes, 66. Yes. And as they're doing this, you're injecting your bite registration material bilaterally. They need that support at night. That, they have to stay there in that same position. Yeah. They stay there. And some people were going to titrate them and even bring them a little bit more. Yeah, and Lou, that's the premise of oral yeah. appliance therapy. You hear people talk about what's called a George age. They're taking a protrusive right, bite. Right. Right. So they're taking a protrusive bite in what people say 50 to 75% of maxillary protrusion. Michael and I don't think you have to even be that far. The premise of so many of these appliances, you just need to prevent your from mandible from falling back. Right. It's not how right. far forward you're going, right? Because right? Right. your tongue's attached there. Right. And your tongue is a big obstruction right. of airway. Right. So the last comment, and I take this very seriously, is Eric says, where do you get your bow ties? <laughs> I love the question. Um, this one, I think I got from Turnbull and Asser in the city, but I appreciate the bow, bow type comment. So I do too. I just want to say thank you both. Thank you. Uh, this has been, I think, honestly, yeah, it's been thanks. a great experience for me sharing this with you, all of you. This will also be on YouTube and we're going to, thousands and thousands of people are going to benefit by this course today. So. Uh, I hope we disrupted your day and I hope this gives you further enlightenment of where we can take this in treating patients in our dental practices. For Catapult Education, Lou Graham, Michael Gelb, and Lane Martin, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Liv. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody.